interaction than webinars. The Department of English and Mrs. College Pandalam is launching a webinar series titled Literature in the New World. Today, we are going to start this series with a talk on the topic Literature and Language Are They Poles Apart by Dr. Yuvaraj. He's a veteran scholar and erudite academician. He's the assistant professor in the PG and Research Department of English, Government Tirumagal Mills College, Gujaratan, Tamil Nadu. His areas of interest are child language, learning and acquisition, language through literature, teacher education, etc. He's also a research guide and has presented a number of papers at various seminars, national and international. On behalf of the Department of English, I deem it my great privilege to welcome you, sir, to this session. I also welcome each and every participant to this session. We are really delighted and overwhelmed by your response across the globe. And uh, we regret any kind of technical glitches. We'll try to resolve it as early as possible. Thank you. Now it's over to you, sir, Dr. Yudraj. Thank you, madam, for the wonderful introduction. So a very good afternoon to one and all present here. At the outset, uh, I would like to thank the management, the principal, and the head of the department, Professor Dr. Anjana, and the organizer, Mr. Sri Prasad, Assistant Professor, Department of English, NSS College, Pandalam, Kerala, for this wonderful opportunity. So I would like to start my presentation. So the topic of my presentation is literature and language, are they poles apart? So I would like to start by telling the learned audience, why did I choose this title? There has been a debate generally, whether it is literature or whether it is language, which is largely beneficial to the learning community. So when uh, the organizer reached out to me to check out my willingness and uh, when he told me about the title series that is literature in the new world i thought it would be appropriate to discuss this uh, topic which i feel it's quite an interesting one because it seems the debate seems to never end whether it is literature or language i would like to discuss the topic or approach the topic rather from different perspectives first from the perspective of a literature buff. So who is a literature buff? A person, one who is very much interested only in literature and literary studies. We have uh, uh, music buffs. Similarly, we do have literature buffs, as I mentioned again. They are very much interested only in literature. So I thought, what would a literature buff uh, how uh, he or she view this particular topic. So, I mean, I'm not, uh, I mean, talking all these, uh, you know, like these issues based on any empirical research. These are insights which I obtained from my colleagues, from my friends when I discuss this issue, especially when I ask a literature a, a, a professor, so would you consider a teaching language? The first response is no way. It is not my cup of tea. So they are definitely not interested to teach language. So again, the disparity is pretty obvious. Again, to quote a, a, a personal exam, I mean experience which I had after completing my research. So as usual, we hunt for a job. And I'm just talking about this instant almost like 115 years before. When we just hunt for a job, when we are in the job hunting process, I happened to apply to an arts and science college and there was a panel and there was a, a, a professor, definitely a, I mean a literature person. So he asked me to say something about my research. That's the usual question. When you say that I finished my research, they might ask you to talk about uh, your research. 
So when I said I had done my research in ELT, the, the next uh, response was, you could have applied to an engineering college. I thought, what is this? Before the interview process started, the result is out. I thought, okay, fine, it is, uh, the result is almost out and uh, he subtly tells me that I will not fit in. So this is another incident which made me think very deeply, why this disparity? Why do we think literature and language are poles apart? Now, the second uh, person I thought was a language specialist, a person, one who would be interested in teaching the language skills, in enriching the language skills of students or who has done a lot of research pertaining to linguistics or social linguistics or ELT. So excuse how me, sir. Excuse yeah. me, Raj, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, the presentation is not yet so clear. Could you please uh, end the presentation and start again? Your, can you share the screen now? One minute. Voice is not clear or the, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, you better uh, stop, uh, stop the presentation and uh, start effort. Is it uh, so, Shri Professor? Is it, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, please. Now, is it visible? Is it, is it the audio clear? Should I have to start yes, from sir. the beginning? From the beginning? No, no, that's your wish. Your wish, sir. You can move with the previous. Slide. No, no, if it, it was not very clear, then I won't mind starting from the beginning, sir. Please let me know. It's clear, it's clear. So, shall I move on to, I mean, to the, uh, the, uh, the first slide which I was discussing? Fine. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Sir, uh, yeah. sir, no, actually no need, sir. Please continue from where you have started. Fine. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah, from the point of view of a language specialist, what would be his reaction? He would definitely say, yes, literature, of course, all of us love literature. And uh, how can one forget? 10,000 saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in a sprightly dance. Such wonderful lines which even now uh, takes all of us to a trip down memory lane, to our undergraduate classes, to our postgraduate classes. So we feel so good when somebody quotes literature. And uh, it so happened a few years before, a uh, high court judge, while pronouncing his verdict, quoted from Shakespeare, uneasy lies the head that bears the crown, from Henry IV, if I'm not wrong. So we. We feel so thrilled. So I, so I, as a an ELT person, I was so happy the whole day. I thought, okay, look at the importance uh, literature gets. So we could see some. Uh, excuse me, sir, Sri Prasad, sir, are you there? Yes, sir. Please continue, sir. Yeah. Okay. No issues. Okay, fine. So, uh, so from okay, so everything uh, from from the language point of view is uh, yeah. So a language specialist would definitely say fine. Everything is fine, but he would ask us a very pertinent. A pertinent question. A pertinent question. What is sir, the sir. sir, excuse me. We are getting some disturbance in the audio, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Participants, please mute your video and audio. Please. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. So, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, a language specialist would definitely ask one pertinent question: What is the utility value, or what is the surrender value of literature to a, a language learner, to an English language learner? I think they form the majority in our classes. So. A language specialist would definitely ask, he won't discount literature. He would say, yes, literature, of course, is a wonderful resource, but in what way can I exploit or what are the benefits of using literature in the classroom? Or in what way I can assure that my learners have picked up language skills which are essential for survival. So I think all of us know for any 
job to, to be successful, they need to have basic language skills, whether it is speaking or writing. So then I thought I had to look at this issue from the learner's point of view. So I'm just trying to justify why I chose this particular title. So from the learner's point of view, so I have categorized learners into two categories. One, learners with fairly good proficiency in English, or I would say learners whose language proficiency is advanced. So again, uh, 10 years of experience in engineering college and uh, the learner population. So what kind of students come to engineering college? 80% to 90% students from CBSE schools. Central Board of Secondary Education, that is the common, uh, which follows a common service throughout India. And uh, children from those schools or learners from those schools are exposed to literature quite mm -hmm. uh, Karim. Oh, Karim. They, they, are, they are exposed to literature quite early, say from standard uh, class three or four. Oh, Mara. Sir, please continue. Sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. So, no problem. So, the uh, learners with, uh, uh, I mean, that's what the CB, in CBS schools, they are exposed to literature, literary texts uh, quite early, that is uh, from class three or four. And uh, as they, uh, I mean, progress to the higher, higher classes, like say from in classes 10 or 11 or 12, they are exposed to literary texts. They read the entire collection of Charles Dickens or George Eliot, all those literary texts they read. So, uh, uh, so sometimes some students must have courage to come and ask me, when are you going to teach us literature? But all of us know in engineering and uh, technical institutes, the, the, the syllabus is purely language based. So the focus is more on the functions of language rather than literature. They are so disappointed. So they are so we don't have prose, we don't have poetry. So it is it's going to be entirely skills based. Fine. So which means they miss literature a lot. So that, that is their perspective. So for them, language acquisition means only through literature. Now, uh, I would like to discuss from the English language learners for point of view. So this is the term which is currently used in uh, when you when I read uh, research articles, it's commonly used. The term English language learners is now commonly used. Earlier, we, they, they, they used to be used to refer to them as LEP students. That is learners with limited English proficient. They are limited English proficient learners. But now I think this is more euphemistic. We call them English language learners. So now we have to understand who is an English language learner in a country like India. So again, almost all my uh, uh, colleagues, my learned colleagues, they know that uh, I mean, almost all uh, in all government school colleges and government aided colleges, English language learners are the majority. More than 72 or 80 to 90 percent learners come with very low uh, proficiency in language and when you just uh, when you think about the background they are from a very uh, socio-economically backward uh, 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 I mean uh, situations and what is the language acquisition that takes place in them there is no so they, they come from a, a very poor which uh, acquisition environments so the uh, only source for these ells for those language learners is the uh, teacher the teacher is the only source through which they can learn little so now somebody can ask the question so with uh, so much of technological advancement with with internet can't they uh, hone their language skills, can they enrich their language skills again? To what extent, the, the, I mean, the internet has reached the nook and corners of the, of the country. And uh, we all know now when, uh, the, during the lockdown period, when teachers are trying their best to reach out uh, to students, students have a list of problems. 
connectivity issues. So with all these issues, uh, 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 an English language learner definitely uh, needs a lot of support and the only source through which he can learn little is the teacher. So what would be his perception? What would he think when I ask this question? Do you think uh, the syllabus, uh, you know, like caters to the needs of you? Do you think it enriches your language skills? And uh, nobody has uh, ever come and told me, no uh, uh, English language learner in government college has not come and told me that, okay, we don't want literature, but it's my assumption. I, out of observation, I'm just uh, conveying, I mean, I'm just expressing it with you. For them, it is the same, whether it is, uh, excerpts from Macbeth or whether it is uh, from Julius Caesar or it is Stephen Leacock's uh, I mean, Maxfield with the photographer or uh, John Milton's uh, Paradise Lost. These are just, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the, the excerpts which I taught the previous semester. So for them, whatever the text is, it doesn't make much difference. So what they uh, uh, what uh, for, the, for the language with a lot of aspirations to uh, to check to see how uh, I can make uh, literature work in the classroom, it becomes a bit challenging because in some universities. Hello, can I continue? Hello, are you? Sir, please do continue, sir. Yeah, You're yeah, clear, thank, sir. Thank, please thank, do continue. Thank you, thank you, madam. So, because I read a message that the host has muted me, so I thought like uh, to some brief. No, no, no. You can be heard. Uh, you can be heard. So, please continue. Thank you, madam. So, uh, so for for the uh, English language learner in majority of the uh, institutions, uh, what what uh, they want is whether the, just I mean just now I listed these are texts which I uh, I mean I taught the previous semester and I'll be teaching. Uh, and my college, which is affiliated to a university, now has hundred percent literature based syllabus. And I, just now I discussed the learner background. What kind of learners I have? It's a small town, uh, and there are villages around, and uh, those students come to college with a, with, a, with a fervent hope that they would learn something and pick up some language skills. So, so with this background, I have to make the, uh, the literary text work in the classroom. So uh, most of them, when you ask them, they say what, uh, what they want, they say just give, uh, give us a summary. So if you give them a summary, if you give them the essay, they are extremely happy. If the teachers don't take the effort to give the summary, yes, there are guidebooks available, there are guides available, so that they can just buy the guide and memorize and uh, write answers and get a pass. So what, uh, and from the ELL point of view, whether it is literature or language, I, uh, out of my observation, it doesn't make much difference because even uh, last uh, two years before, in the previous syllabus, we had a 20% uh, language component and there will be uh, a dialogue writing. And even the dialogue writing, they'll memorize and they'll come and write. And uh, it throws a lot of light on uh, the issues of testing. So when we say a skills-based approach, or when we try to introduce a little bit of a language in, uh, in uh, I mean, uh, for learners, how do we test? For example, we want to test their uh, speaking skills, their spoken ability, but how are we doing it? Only by writing. So again, this is totally contradictory and in the guidebooks, they give different situations, three or four different uh, situations, and there are 10 exchanges listed over there. These children memorize them because they are 100% sure one of those questions will appear in the end semester. So this is the uh, observation which I made. And for him, whether it, whether it is language or literature, whether he had different goals, doesn't matter because for him, what he wants is just a pass so that he can get his degree. Okay, so now uh, I would like to focus on the syllabus. So it, it, it is again the same, you know, the, the what, what purpose does the syllabus serve? Does it serve the purpose? Like again, majority of the universities, 
the, when you when you take a look at the uh, uh, conference which we are supposed to discuss, we get a feel like uh, what kind of uh, thought has gone gone into it. And again, another question arises: Does it try to widen the gap further? For example, this literature and language gap, which is already uh, ex existing, it should sort of try to bridge the gap. But I uh, somehow feel that it almost widens the gap further. And uh, the next question. What is the basis on which the textbook or the course book gets approved by the board of studies? So again, it's a it's a question which nobody can answer because what on what basis again a textbook gets textbook or a, a course book gets prescribed? And that takes us to the next question: Is there any hidden agenda which I cannot discuss in a public forum? And so I leave it to the learned audience to interpret in whatever way they want. Continuing with the syllabus, we, uh, we have a, a general philosophy of education. So we need to consider the general philosophy of education tells that we have to consider the following factors before we sort of finalize the syllabus. So the, what are the crucial uh, factors? First and foremost is who. So who are the learners and again, who are the teachers? So in this context, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of uh, an approach which was quite popular in Tamil Nadu some uh, 10 years before, which was introduced at the school level. It was called activity-based learning. So the buzzword now is activities. You know, you, you, you uh, engage the child in an activity, so he learns. So somebody has proposed this idea to the government and the government faithfully implemented it in, at the school level. So what I'm talking about is these, I mean, which happened in schools and which is still being followed in many schools, what they call it as the activity-based learning. So I'm just trying to give an example of who, that is who includes both the learners as well as the teachers. So before we finalize on a, a, a particular methodology or the syllabus, we have to take into consideration both the learners as well as the teachers. So now activity-based learning, I'm not against the activity-based learning or the methodology. It's a wonderful methodology wherein we can ensure learner participation, we can motivate the learner, we can make the learners feel comfortable in the class. Language learning happens in a stress-free environment. Yes, accept it. But are the, are the teachers trained? That is a very crucial question. So it is not that easy to try out communicative, uh, I mean, uh, uh, CLT work in class, that is communicative language teaching. So ABL is loosely based on communicative language teaching methodology, which strongly advocates don't teach formal aspects of grammar, don't teach form, teach only the functions. Create a learning environment wherein you will involve the learners, participate the learners, what in ELT we call it as participatory pedagogy. So make the learners involved in the process of learning and they will learn. Everything is fine. But the key question one has to ponder is what kind of training given to them? Some, some training was given to them, say for 10 or 15 days, again, after a month, one or one more follow-up training will be given. After that, there is no support system available for the teacher. So without considering these factors, the syllabus is framed and uh, it, is, uh, it is like, sometimes I, I mean, I, I, I use the word forced it on the teacher who is one of the most important stakeholders in the field of education. So this is what I mean by who. So the question of whether the uh, syllabus adheres to a general philosophy of education. So the next question is where? Where is that nothing but the teaching context? So whether in what teaching context the syllabus is going to happen? Whether again, whether it will work in this particular context? Next question, when am I going to use this syllabus? When in the sense, like other, whether at the, in the first semester or in the second semester or in the final semester, sometimes uh, in technical institutes, even in the final semester, we have a language component that is to uh, prepare them for uh, employment, what they call it as employability skills and soft skills. These three crucial factors largely, I mean, should, uh, will largely impact what and how. So what is nothing but the content and how, again, is the methodology. Ideally speaking, the first three things should be take, should be considered 
and only then the last two things we should give thought uh, thought about uh, we should think about the last two factors but uh, i think in almost in all uh, i mean uh, i mean uh, in universities it's the other way around so we decide on what the learner will learn the syllabus is decided first and that too when a syllabus is decided we also have the testing in mind so what if i cannot get this particular aspect because how do i test the end semester uh, the, the the issues pertaining to assessment and testing largely decides i would say the content so it should be the other way around so in what way what are the needs of the learner so in what way my learners will be benefited so there is nothing called needs analysis that is done which in elt they largely focus on before we introduce a course to the learners it is mandatory that we conduct a sort of a needs analysis survey and try to understand what the learners want but it is so ironical the learners who are i would say the, the most most very uh, i mean significant uh, stakeholders in the field of uh, education and the teachers who are going to translate whatever the syllabus says into the classroom they are i, I don't think they are consulted i think handful of people sit there decide and it, and uh, the board of studies approves it and uh, teachers we are supposed to go to the classroom and face a lot of challenges and we somehow try to complete the syllabus because there is always the uh, the threat looming large have you completed the syllabus so now i think almost all of us would have you know frantically reached our students because somehow or the other we wanted to ensure that the syllabus has been completed so this is what happens but it should be the other way around and this is one component i thought uh, that deserves a lot of uh, thinking yeah with this i would like to move on to the next uh, issue so given uh, the uh, challenges and constraints whatever i discussed so far the, there are a lot of constraints and there are a lot of challenges but in spite of that i thought uh, why uh, we should just keep on harping on the the divide why should we always say that is a, 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 i mean uh, they, they are poles apart uh, the i mean i i, I was also reminded of uh, uh, i don't remember the name of the poet but uh, uh, east is east and west is west never the twain shall meet so i thought like is it not i, I don't think it's like that so why don't i take the initiative and try to make literature work in the classroom so To, to talk on this particular topic why literature and language are poles apart so well, the, the, i mean the, my slide tells me like i i just listed out three models that are available on why literature in language teaching and i think it's uh, uh, yeah one minute yeah the first one is the cultural model and the language model and the personal growth model it was brumfit who first uh, uh, sort of thought about it and it was later Uh, advocated by Carter and Long. So, what is the benefit? So, I have sort of uh, summarized the benefits of these models, the positive impact of these models, and how it positively impacts the learner. So, I'm talk. I'm just I've taken a. Uh, I mean, the issue of how literature positively impacts the learner. So, what are the uh, positive? Uh, I mean, imp what uh, I mean, impact. the first one is it fosters intercultural understanding and thereby it mitigates cultural differences it encourages critical thinking so uh, critical thinking is the buzzword now so wherever we go people talk about critical thinking we have to make our learners think critically so that we can prepare them to be global citizens so the i mean it, it's i mean it's uh, quite interesting to observe that there are a lot of issues going around the world in terms of uh, Uh, racial and cultural bullying so uh, and which largely affects the students the students get affected and uh, sometimes you know because of this bullying they drop out of school which is a, a, a very disturbing trend and not only at the school level i think even at uh, institutes of higher learning these things do happen when there are cultural differences and when students cannot get along and when they bully each other it Uh, affects them and fix them and leaves an indelible scar on the psyche of the person one who gets bullied so the positive aspect of literature that is the first one uh, uh, that is uh, we can introduce literary texts which uh, uh, glorify multiculturalism or which talks about the benefits of uh, 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 you know the diversity uh, we can uh, 
these texts can be introduced in the classroom and it also ensures critical thinking and the next point is again it is it's a sort of a continuation i would say uh, integration of english language learners involves more than just linguistics so we we, we look uh, i look at it purely from the language point of view so the learners they don't have language and again uh, uh, i'm reminded of uh, basil bernstein's uh, verbal deficit theory so where he claims uh, i mean this claim was later refuted but initially the claim what uh, bernstein uh, in the sociology, sociology of education what what was the claim the claim he made was uh, learners who come from uh, i mean a socio economically back, uh, backward uh, uh, communities they are l1 is not fully developed so he says it is not only l2 we talk so much about the second language we talk so much about they they are not in a position to learn english but he says that is a sec i mean that is also an important issue but first focus on their l1 their l1 is not uh, fully developed so in this context he talks about the restricted code and the elaborated code and uh, i mean let me not go into the details but it reminds me this particular point by clayton reminds me of that so why l1 is important why the first language is important he says l1 is a wonderful resource so we we need to tap uh, the 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 l1 resources so that we can encourage learners to learn l2 so this is what we call when, uh, i mean it's it's a sort of con contrastive analysis and wherein we say that it's it's positive transfer so when you are l1 when we are very good in your of a first language it generally facilitates second language learning so is uh, the the idea of you know like uh, it is purely linguistics though they have only linguistic uh, deficiency is uh, not exactly true clayton says it involves cultural aspects also so if they are not used to the culture or if they resent the uh, alien culture then the benefits of schooling so whatever uh, the benefits they are going to reap uh, in schooling or at the university level children will not get and it is not only to do with linguistic aspects but there are other social and cultural issues involved in that so this takes me to the next uh, point of this uh, expansion of vocabulary so yes again uh, sometimes we used to long for our uh, ug ma classes or our mphil classes and we'll be reminded of our professors so what fine english what vocabulary he has what vocabulary madam has so it definitely literature we we read a lot of literature it expands our vocabulary it enriches our vocabulary there is no doubt about that so the next point which i have listed out is fluency in reading so one might ask what do we mean by fluency so fluency is been described in a uh, different terms uh, you know but uh, the simple definition uh, we can we can say is fluency is uh, largely equated to the way you speak if you somebody speaks fast we generally say is a fluent speaker so but it is not uh, the case because somebody can speak very fast at the same time he might not get across his ideas so fluency i i had this definition from professor saraswati my mphil uh, supervisor uh, so ma'am uh, uh, professor saraswati once in, in an elt class told me like fluency is nothing but if you can do something without much effort and still if you are successful that is what is fluency all about so it is not we have to uh, try and get what what do you mean by fluency but fluency is not only in speaking we do have fluency in reading and writing also so sometimes we feel writers we say uh, he he or she has a flair for writing so his writing is so good so what makes it so special it is the same idea they would have conveyed but we prefer to read one particular author because the style of writing the flair for writing is something different that is what we mean by fluency in reading so when we read a lot of literature when a learner is exposed to literary text naturally it benefits both uh, is reading and writing skills and uh, the next one what we are going to focus on it improves interpretive and inferential skills yes uh, i i don't think i have to uh, explain it's uh, quite obvious that we interpret uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, for example one line can be interpreted in many ways uh, i mean uh, a quotation that comes to my mind is uh, less is more lucrezia and judged so i think it's by robert browning in andrea del sarto so i remember what kind of discussion it triggered in the classroom and uh, 
uh, I mean, it, it went on for us together. So this is what literature does to uh, to the learner. It, 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 it enriches its interpretive and its inferential skills, which are highly essential. And uh, Bilosin uh, points out uh, exposure to literature gives greater. I mean, uh, students uh, when they are uh, when they read, they get a lot of exposure to varieties of lexical and syntactical patterns, which is again very important for successful language learning. Just a second, I will. Yeah, so uh, with this, I, I'm almost done with my first half of the presentation and the second half, uh, what I have done is I've just taken a very simple short story by Ruskin Bond and I tried this with my students. And uh, why I did this, why uh, it, it was uh, uh, done, in, uh, done a year before, but I thought uh, for this topic, this would uh, be to, to an extent related. So the, the object or the objective of this particular uh, task, reading task, followed by a, a, a speaking skills task is to see whether I can make liter literature, a literary text, a short story that would by Ruskin Bond. I, I felt that this language is quite simple, so I thought, why not try this in my classroom? It was done almost a year before, and uh, I've just given you the excerpt. And uh, before you, you read the ex excerpt, I just uh, I narrate the story and put it in a nutshell. It is between, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's about a beautiful friendship that blossoms between an old lady, Miss McKenzie, and a small boy named Anil. Miss McKenzie lives in a, in a mansion, in a huge mansion, all alone. And uh, she has a beautiful garden where she uh, maintains you know, wonderful, exotic wild flowers. So she likes flowers a lot. And uh, Anil, a small boy in the vicinity, when uh, he goes to school, one day uh, he was so fascinated, he was attracted by the flowers. So he just trespasses and he starts picking the flowers. So this is the uh, this is what is what happens in the story to begin with, and now if you read the excerpt, it would uh, to an extent I think it it will make uh, we can understand it much better. So Miss McKenzie comes and uh, asks uh, uh, him, "What are you doing? Why did you press us?" And uh, the small boy Anil says, uh, "Picking flowers, Miss." And he held up a bunch of ferns and wild flowers. Oh, Miss McKenzie was disarmed. It was a long time since she had seen a boy taking interest in flowers and, what was more, playing truant from school in order to gather them. Do you like flowers? She asked. Yes, miss. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be a botan uh, uh, botanist. You mean a botanist? And uh, the excerpt continues. The boy says, yes, miss. And, uh, well, that's unusual. Most boys at your age want to be pilots or soldiers or perhaps engineers. but you want to be a botanist. Well, well, there's still hope for the world, I see. And uh, do you know the names of these flowers? So what happens, uh, the, uh, the old lady lives all alone and the boy takes interest in flowers and she, and she it, it becomes a routine for them to share and uh, uh, I mean, discuss wild flowers. And one fine day, Anil comes and informs uh, the old lady that I am for my vacation, I am uh, leaving for Delhi. I will come, I'll meet you after three months. And uh, the lady, before uh, uh, I mean, uh, before he leaves, uh, she has an encyclopedia. That is, a, I mean, of, like, I mean, encyclopedia on I mean, flowers, which she treasured because it was uh, her brother who was uh, using it, and so she treasured treasures that. But she thinks it is uh, better to give it to the small boy who evinces a lot of interest in botany. So, but the boy, the small boy, Anil hesitates. He says, uh, I, "I don't want." Uh, I mean, Miss. I mean, that's that's how he addresses her. I don't want Miss. I'll come and take it, take it, take this book later from you. But uh, uh, Miss uh, McKenzie tells, no, you have to have this because I don't know whether when you come, I'll be here or not. So this is a sort of. Uh, uh, it sounds quite ominous. And uh, what happens uh, after a few months when the winter is very harsh and because of the old age, Miss McKenzie passes away. This is the story. This is the gist of the story, which I. Uh, took it to my class and I tried with my students. So what happened in the classroom? So I told you they are uh, undergraduate students. 
from science departments because I happened to meet the students from science department. So I thought I would try it out with them and it wasn't prescribed. So as I told you, it was not a prescribed text. Out of interest, I thought I just wanted to take it to class to check to see to what extent I am successful or to what extent I can uh, uh, I mean manipulate or I can exploit literature in the language classroom. So uh, the learners were from science backgrounds, undergraduate learners, uh, second year undergraduate learners. They were, I mean, I asked them to read the story and respond orally. So this was the instruction given to them. And uh, I generally, after joining a government college uh, five years before, I started using uh, a bilingual method because entire lecture in English, initially I was doing it one for the first uh, year. All my lectures were in English and later on I found it is of no use, literally. So I thought it's better to change and try and make the learners understand something. So. I mean, I'm just trying my best to use both, uh, I mean, the regional language, Tamil and English in, in the classroom. So the instructions were given both in English as well as in Tamil and a lot of scaffolding was done. So all of us know what uh, I mean by scaffolding, giving them the language support as well as support in other ways also, because scaffolding was done from the beginning, from stage one, we need to give them support. So it's a three page story, uh, but for us, student of literature, it, it would not take, or a reader, one was proficient, one was one was fairly good language skills, for him or for her, it would not take more than half an hour or at the most 20 minutes. But for these learners, it definitely would take more than two hours. Even, I mean, without support, it's very difficult. Even with support, it takes a lot of time for them. And some of them, while reading, they give it up because they find there are different words, unusual words. For them, it's, it's totally an unfamiliar word. So they don't take the effort. So a lot of scaffolding was done from the part from uh, as a teacher, I took a lot of scaffolding from the beginning at various uh, intervals. So what I observed was some of them were a bit reluctant as usual, you know, most of the learners, uh, not all learners uh, will be so enthusiastic and that would be an ideal classroom, which uh, no teacher can expect whatever the task may be, whether it is be literature or read. So they don't take the effort. So a lot of scaffolding was done from uh, the part from uh, as, as a teacher trying to do the scaffolding. I could hear my voice. Asab, uh, uh, Sri Prasadzar, are you there? Hello? I'm here. I'm here, sir. Please, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of scaffolding because I suddenly heard uh, uh, the recording. That's what I thought. I would check it out. Okay. So a lot. Uh, so some of them were, uh, were a bit reluctant, and uh, some learners were uh, quite keen, but uh, they they admitted that they wanted to express their opinions in the regional language. So language was a major hindrance. They said, uh, I have a lot of ideas, sir, but I just want to express in Tamil. I, I, I just said, go ahead, because I was quite happy to see some learners at least respond to the text. And it, it took almost an hour for them to understand the story, to make them understand this, what is the story all about? And then some of them wanted to express their views, what they felt the, the intention, what I had was to make them uh, respond to the text, but uh, uh, what I uh, what I observed was during the discussion there was a lot of digression. So the discussion then centered around the story. So a lot of digression in the sense they uh, they talked about their uh, uh, I mean how they engage themselves in farming, how they help uh, the, uh, his father and in, in those in such activities. And one boy said, uh, "I have four cows at home." And I take care of them. I have to. I have to maintain those cows one after uh, when I reach home, or early in the morning. I wake up and I maintain the cows. It was. I would definitely say it was just an eye opener for me. So, uh, so because never did I get a chance to interact with the with the with the kids. It was just an eye opener, and I thought, okay, fine. But as I told you, it was a. It was totally a digression. You know, it was not focused on the text, but it doesn't matter because it provided an opportunity for the learners to open their mouth and say something and it was an opportunity for me to listen to them as well and and get to know so much about uh, uh, okay so what insights did i gain as a teacher so the the first point is i as a teacher i i i i understood that literary texts but that is a word of caution not all literary texts so we need to be very careful in the choice of the text. How do we select the text? Selection is very important. Not all texts might work. 
So it is very important that we choose a text which is fairly simple and uh, which has the plot which students can relate to. So I, I understood that this uh, a certain literary text can be manipulated, will definitely work in the classroom. And uh, the second point is it, uh, it is uh, Showalter who said this and I have taken the uh, idea. So it will help learners personalize the reading experience or reactions to a text that help connect reading to students' lives. So it is sort of uh, making them, you know, uh, understand that literature is not something, uh, you know, non, uh, it exists somewhere. It is not that, uh, we can, I mean, you can see the connect between literature and life. So it was definitely, I mean, it is definitely a learning point for me too. So, and also for the learners, it should have been definitely. And it is also, I would, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, just, uh, I apologize in case if I'm wrong. It is, uh, I, I, I felt that it's somewhat similar to this reader response theory, wherein uh, the reader becomes the writer. So I think it's Roland Darts who talks about the death of the author and he says like, uh, there is nothing called the text or there is, no, there is nothing on your computer screen whatever meaning making happens it happens in your mind so i could see that really happen because though the, there was digression students could largely connect to the text they, this has made some kind of uh, they made an attempt so i'm not again we are making some tall claims that learners responded really well and, and all of them spoke in english that would definitely be a very tall claim those things didn't happen at all the only minor change i could see was they tried their best to respond in the classroom, definitely not in English. Some of them tried, but after, after the first one or two sentences, they, they wanted to, uh, I, mean, so, I mean, sort of uh, code switching was done. They said, sir, I, I want to speak in English, I mean, in Tamil. So uh, then uh, the next point is, I, it also like uh, literature sometimes blends itself very well to be exploited in different ways. For example, the same text, the same story, can be exploited for enriching the, uh, I mean, the, uh, lang the linguistic skills of learners. So there are, in the excerpt you would have seen, do you like class? And there are so much language there. So as a teacher, what I thought is, yes, it can be exploited even to teach question forms, which for the learner is very, very challenging. Yes, no questions. So can be taught, you know. Uh, I, I'm, so I, I thought, okay, fine, I'm using literature as a resource and for personal growth. So one of the, in, in one of the models when, uh, when, when I just shared my views, it says like literature can be used for personal gains to enrich their personality. Yes, to a large extent, it can definitely be exploited in different ways. And again, why I, sh uh, I, uh, I show that excerpt is when uh, McKinsey, uh, McKinsey says, it's quite unusual for boys of your age because they want to become an engineer or a pilot but, for, but uh, you want to become a botanist. So this might be the starting point. This could trigger definitely a discussion in the class. So we can ask them what, what exactly the kind of aspirations these learners have. So it need not be something very great, but even if they come up with some interesting uh, ideas or they say like, I want to become a, an IES officer. Yes, there is a lot of scope for them. And as a teacher, I, uh, we have to encourage them and say, yes, if you try your best and if you put in your best efforts, these things can definitely happen. So there is a lot of uh, scope for personal growth uh, in, when, when I, I tried this. And uh, uh, the learner's perception. So how the learner would view his perception would have, I, but I didn't, again, it's not empirical research wasn't done. It is just a very casual uh, uh, task, I would say. So uh, I, but I feel that the learners' perception towards literature changed to an extent. Not all learners, I would say. So they would have thought literature is nothing, something esoteric, just like uh, something you know. Uh, uh, I mean, like something like philosophy. I mean, we always feel this, the philosophers' base are some. I mean, sometimes inscrutable. So, so it, it, is, it changed their perception. So to an extent, they would have thought okay, literature is not something uh, you know out there. It is. Uh, I mean, it's, it's something, you know, what we can re relate to it if I sincerely take the effort. And uh, uh, Lars sort of sums up and he says like uh, teachers have to draw on the range of insights available and then to develop an approach appropriate and relevant to their needs. So this uh, again takes us to the question of appropriate methodology and social context. And this is the title of the book by Adrian Holiday. 
It's a wonderful uh, resource book wherein he discusses in detail the importance of context in choosing a methodology. So we cannot just like the choose any methodology. We have to choose a methodology which will work in an appropriate context. In in your classroom, one methodology would have to an extent work. I mean, if if at least like in your classroom, in a sense, like if you are in a different, uh, uh, I mean, uh, state or in a different country with a different set of learners, yes. But the same task or the same learning material or the same uh, literature text need not work in my classroom. So we have to think that there are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we have to think that the teaching context is very important and uh, it's a wonderful book by Adrian Holiday, Appropriate Methodology and Social Context. So I think I'm almost done with my uh, presentation. So I would like to conclude uh, my presentation. It's one of, uh, one of, the, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, lines, I would say, in literature. And I think all of us would have definitely read if winter comes, can spring be far behind. So why I chose, I mean, this, this line was quite inspiring because uh, in the current scenario, when the entire world is reeling under uh, the pandemic, there is one, the literature gives us a hope. It says like, don't worry, things will definitely be all right. So if winter comes, can spring be far behind. And uh, I hope webinars like this provide a lot of opportunities and uh, create meaningful discussions, which uh, would largely benefit the teaching and the learning community. And I sincerely hope all of us as teachers will get back to our classrooms and interact with our learners with renewed interest and bigger. Thank you so much for your patient listening.